them? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Can you see everybody out there? I can. How's everybody doing? Yeah. So, Hi, um, folks. yeah. So this is Brian, owner of Tally Vineyards. Has anybody been down to visit Tally Vineyards? You have to go. I went and had a great time down there. My husband and I went. Um, so Brian, I was hoping you could tell us the history of Tally and what you do there. And we have tons of questions for you. So I'll just let you take it. And uh, I'll probably pop in like every 10 minutes or so to introduce a new wine and ask you some questions. Sure. Sound good? All right. Yeah, so uh, sounds great. So uh, yeah, uh, my name is Brian Tally, and uh, I'm a third generation farmer based in the San Luis Obispo coast region. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, I met Rob and, and uh, Diana Jensen back in the mid nineties. Uh, we share, uh, uh, at that time, we shared a number of, of distributors that were selling our wines. And um, Rob started asking me about selling grapes to him, um, probably uh, about the first time we met about 1995 or so. And at that time, I, I didn't have any grapes available for sale. Uh, we were able to rectify that situation in, in the early 2000s. And uh, I, to tell you the truth, I can't remember the, the first year that uh, a Testarossa Tally Vineyards wine was released, but I think it was, uh, it was sometime in the, in the early 2000s. My history in the area dates back to uh, uh, 1948, actually, my grandfather started growing vegetables in the Arroyo Grande Valley. And then um, uh, my father, when he came back to the business uh, after graduating from college, uh, suggested to my grandfather that we start buying some of the land that uh, we had been renting up uh, to that point, uh, purchased our, our first property, which is actually the home of Rosemary's Vineyard in 1966 and started planting wine grapes in 1982. We made our first wines uh, at Tally Vineyards in 1986. And uh, really since that time, we have sold um, between 10 and 20% of, of the grapes that, that, uh, that we grow to uh, artisanal, uh, uh, world-class uh, wineries uh, like like Testarossa, and so uh, that's just a brief bit of background on uh, on what what we do. So uh, with that, uh, Sue, I'm not sure if uh, you or some other folks in the group uh, have some questions that they would like to ask. Can you can you hear me? I hope. I can, yes. Yeah, oh, great. Because we do have a lot of questions on um, on your history, especially, but also um, the, just the Arroyo Grande Valley AVA. And um, can you talk a little bit about that and the climate and the soil that's there? Sure. OK. So um, the Arroyo Grande Valley, uh, as an AVA, was, was officially established, I believe, in 1990. And uh, it was my dad, uh, my father, Don Talley, um, co-founder of Talley Vineyards, who uh, really, really led the charge on that. Uh, the Arroyo Grande Valley is, is unique in the sense that, first of all, it's a very cool uh, ABA because we're very close to the ocean. Uh, our our uh, Rosemary's and Rincon Vineyards are located between six and seven miles from the ocean. Though we also benefit from a real diversity of soils, uh, over 150 acres between six different vineyard sites between the Edna and Arroyo Grande Valleys, we are farming about a dozen different soil types. Uh, between the Rincon Vineyard, which is where my father started planting the vines in 1982, uh, those, those are really dominated by the, the classic soils of Burgundy, which are calcareous clays, those wines tend to express um, some, some uh, beautiful minerality. And then Rosemary's Vineyard, which is a vineyard that surrounds my mother's house, uh, about a mile southwest of the Rincon Vineyard, is this uh, very shaly loam soil. 
and it's the combination of uh, uh, that very cool site uh, combined with those uh, shaley soils that that really lend Rosemary's Vineyard wines the uh, the precision that uh, the vineyard has, has come to be known for. Um, that's great because I noticed when I was researching, there's a lot of different soils just in, in your vineyard as opposed to some other vineyards in the Royal Grande and to what we put on our uh, on our website. So that's pretty fun. I'm going to introduce the, the first wine that we have since you're seated, which is the new release, the 19 Rosemary Chardonnay. So while everybody's uh, taking a sip of that, Brian, would you like to tell about maybe what the harvest was like in 2019, uh, the growing conditions? Sure. Um, you know, 2019 was uh, sort of interesting from the standpoint that uh, compared to 2020, which was a very dramatic uh, vintage for us because of, of all the smoke in our region, uh, 2019 was decidedly uh, less dramatic than that. Uh, 2018 was noted for the fact that it was our longest growing season. And so I would describe 2019 as sort of a, a no drama uh, return to uh, kind of a, a, a new normal for Vitaly. And uh, though I uh, haven't had a chance to taste the Testarossa wines that were produced uh, in, in the vintage, I can tell you that uh, the, the wines that we made at our winery uh, really have the characteristic uh, spine and uh, uh, energetic acidity that is really the hallmark of both Tally Vineyards and, and the region. And so as, uh, as you taste the wine, that's uh, one thing that I would uh, be looking for right now. What does everybody think about the 2019 Chardonnay? Very nice, it is smooth, right? Right away out of the get-go. Um, does anybody have any questions for Brian? Hold on, Brian. All right, I see a hand go up there. I got that. I was wondering, um, obviously you're you're doing Pinot and Chardonnay, but do you do other grapes that you, uh, other varietals that you bottle at your vineyard? We do. And, and so while the focus of the winery really is Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, I also produce Sauvignon Blanc, which we have done since um, our inaugural vintage in 1986. Uh, we have more recently added Syrah. We've been producing that since the late 90s. Um, and then more recently than that, uh, Gruner Veltliner and Grenache. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm a proud farmer, they're, they're all exceptional, though Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are my uh, my very favorites. So I have one more question. If I was listening correctly, you said that you planted the Rincon Vineyard in 1982, and then your first harvest was 86. Is that what I heard? Uh, actually, uh, just to put a bit more precision on that, uh, we, we started planting the vineyard in 1982, and our first commercial release as Tally Vineyards was in 1986. We actually sold some grapes in 1984 and 85, and we have continued to sell grapes to other wineries, um, really the during the entire existence of, uh, of Tally Vineyards. So, so it's actually about a two or three year period before you can really start using the grapes after you plant a, a new vineyard? That is correct. Thank you. So Brian, I looked and it says 2010 is the first year for Testarossa with Rincon and with okay. Rosemary. Yeah. And with Rosemary's um, 2014 is the first with the Pinot. 2016 is our first with the Chardonnay. All right. Well, yeah. Sue, thank you for fact checking me. <laughs> I want to make sure that we got it all on top there. Well, so, um, I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions anybody has here? Oh, yeah. One more question over here. From Joan. <laughs> hey, Joan. A Joan's a troublemaker. Hi, Brian. I was interested to hear about what you think the drought conditions are going to be like for the 2021 harvest. Well, 
uh, we are blessed in the Arroyo Grande Valley with a, uh, uh, a very plentiful uh, supply of water. And uh, like just about everybody who's producing world-class wine in, in California, we, we do um, employ drip irrigation to supplement uh, natural rainfall. And so, uh, you know, I, I think 2021 uh, got off to a great start. We had a beautiful bud break, very, very even, uh, but it's been a surprisingly cool spring. And uh, I don't know how many of you have noticed that uh, up in the Silicon Valley area. Uh, raise your hand if you think it's been a cool spring. Yeah, it's very cool today. I, yeah, wore long sleeves. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been cold and windy down our way. And so that's uh, kind of confusing the vines. And uh, we've got some, some bloom underway in some blocks. And uh, uh, it's, it's really kind of uh, stretching things out a little bit. Having said that, I go into every harvest with the expectation that I'm going to make the best wine that, uh, that we have ever produced before. And uh, no, that's my expectation going into 2021. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Brian. So um, did you want to tell us a little bit about, you were saying the history, but I remember I went for a tour recently. Well, not recently, about two years ago. And one of you, the tour guide told me that you are the largest grower of cilantro in the U.S. I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> I thought that was really fun. Uh, I don't think that that's actually true, but we are certainly <laughs> one of the larger gro growers of cilantro in California. And the reason for that is because cilantro really thrives in um, that same cool coastal uh, environment where Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir thrive. And uh, I happen to love uh, cilantro. Uh, interestingly, my, my father, uh, who was the original or the originator of, uh, uh, of, of that particular vegetable for uh, my family's operation, was actually kind of allergic to it, um, <laughs> as, is, uh, as is my cousin. So uh, anyway, we, we do grow about 20 different vegetables to support um, both wholesale distribution of vegetables as well as a CSA program. Uh, we also grow lemons and avocados. And uh, this is a good opportunity for me to make the plug that uh, avocados and, and Chardonnay are just a wonderful combination that I encourage everybody to, uh, to explore. Yeah, well, thank you, we will. Yeah, what about, what kind of avocados? Uh, we grow Hass avocados, which are uh, really uh, kind of the, the, the avocado that the market prefers. Those are the ones with the, uh, the bumpy skin. Uh, they tend to ship very well. Uh, their, their only challenge uh, is that they are a little bit like Pinot Noir in the sense that they don't yield as much as uh, some of the other varieties. Very good. Well, I'll have to go down there and visit or make a recipe with avocados in it, drink some Chardonnay. Which, yeah. by the way, speaking of uh, coming down to visit, uh, everybody who's here has a, uh, an invitation to come down and see us at Tally Vineyards. We would, uh, we would love to show you uh, what we're doing there and uh, encourage you to come visit our, our farm and winery. Good. <laughs> All right, I see a fist yeah. bump uh, yeah. way there in the back. So, awesome. Yeah. All right, we have another question too, but that's great. I will, maybe we have to do like a little road trip for everybody. Yeah, yeah. We, all right, We might need on. to do that. Yes. Hello. Is this working? Oh, you can hear me. Hi, Brian. Um, my name is Pam and I work at Testarossa and I have a question for you. You were talking about the innovations that your grandfather and your father brought. And I, the fact you mentioned Gruner Veltliner and Grenache, I was wondering if one of the innovations that you're bringing is like heat tolerant grapes to the area. And if you want to share why those are being planted or is that accurate? Well, um, really the, the why for, uh, you know, why we have expanded our, our uh, palette of, of the grapes that we're growing. Um, has to do with a, a shift in our focus, which is to uh, 
do a better job of serving people who come to visit the winery. Uh, one of the things that we have noticed as we've gotten feedback from our customers is that they appreciate a greater selection of, of wines other than just uh, single vineyard bottlings of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And um, that led us to explore um, other varieties. Uh, quite frankly, um, uh, Gruner Veltliner is uh, my wife's second, or actually it's her third favorite variety, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, being number one, Chardonnay being number two. And since we already had those covered, uh, you know, I, I figured I could earn a lot of brownie points by uh, planting uh, Gruner Veltliner. So what's her name? And are you going to name the Gruner after her, like Rosemary's? <laughs> <laughs> uh, her name is Janine. And uh, Janine is uh, uh, very self-effacing and a little bit shy. And uh, to this point, we have not had a conversation about naming the Gruner Veltliner uh, after her. It's actually planted in the vineyard that is named after my grandfather, uh, oh. Oliver. And uh, to this point, it's just the Tally Vineyards uh, Gruner Veltliner. Uh, you know, I think the topic of, of climate change uh, and how it's affecting wine growing in California is an interesting topic. Personally, I think the effect in the coastal parts of California is less dramatic than it is in the more inland areas, because uh, typically what's happening is that as the uh, uh, inland areas are warming, they just continue to uh, pull uh, more cool air just right over the top of the, uh, of, of the coastal areas. And so we have not seen as dramatic an impact uh, in our region as I would say folks, uh, especially in the continental parts of Europe, that's probably where the most dramatic effects of, of uh, global warming in the wine industry uh, have been seen, places like Germany and uh, in Burgundy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I see somebody who uh, looks like they're beckoning either for the microphone yes. or oh, a no, glass she, of wine. Well, yes, she does. She wanted to ask about which, what did you want? Oh, yes. She wants to know what is Gruna um, Veltliner? What is Gruna Veltliner? To, similar to, like, yeah, what, it, what did, it, does have a taste I similar to another brand? I describe Gruna Veltliner as a mashup of Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling. And uh, Gruner Veltliner is the most widely planted variety in Austria, which is uh, basically, uh, you know, a little bit south of, of uh, you know, the main growing regions in Germany. So it's a little bit warmer. And, uh, but it has an interesting um, herbaceous or even vegetal component that uh, some folks, uh, uh, notes with uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and it happens to be the best uh, variety, in my opinion, to pair with uh, vegetable dishes. So if we have any vegetarians in the group, uh, Gruner Veltliner is a good go-to for your uh, vegetarian dishes. Great. All right, we're going to move on to the, the second wine, your second Chardonnay, seeded Chardonnay, and that is our 2017 Rosemary's. So a little okay. bit of age on that. Yep. So I am sending you the wines, Brian. So you can enjoy them at your leisure. I know that you can't drink right. them. Right. But you'll get to taste them. I, I look forward to that. Yep. I'll send them out tomorrow. Yeah. What does everybody think about it? Right? You can see the difference from the bright, bright acidity of this. So while we're tasting this beautiful wine, which I should tell you, age 19 months and 35% new French oak. So a little bit different, right? Than the Sure, that's, that's a little bit more new wood than we use. We're, we typically use uh, between 20 and 25% new French oak. And um, we age our Rosemary's Vineyard Chardonnay typically about 15 months. And uh, what I can tell you about the 2017 vintage is uh, you know that that was our emergence from the um, the drought that really persisted uh, uh, between 2011 
and uh, 2016, uh, one of the effects, I mean, I was very thankful for the rain that we had, but the conditions that year uh, were a bit challenging from a wine growing standpoint, had a little bit of uneven ripening. And I described the wines that we produce at Tally Vineyards as having a bit more of an edge to them as opposed to say 2018, which was, is a bit more uh, harmonious. So I was, I was reading up on it and it seems like um, a big thing about the Chardonnays that come from Tally is it's known for the acidity, right? So pretty, um, yes. yes, right? That's what I thought. And, and so the acidity from Rosemary's Vineyard is, is uh, some of the highest that uh, uh, is, is produced in, in California. It's a very cool site and marked by uh, these very, very uh, shaly soils. And you put that combination together and that yields these wines that uh, tend to have uh, real focus and, and energy. And so uh, not having the wine in front of me right now to taste it, uh, I'm not sure if that's what you're tasting, but uh, that's certainly what I taste uh, with, with the wines that we produce. Does anybody have a comment on the 2017, what they're thinking or tasting? Yeah. The difference? Yeah. Here, I'll let you do this before oh, I can show you. So. Let's move up the wine. Yeah. Um, I find that the 2019 has more malolactic fermentation on the nose, while the 2017 tends to be a little bit softer on the acidity in the back palate. But it's very smooth, very good. I enjoy it. Anybody else? Yeah, very good. Right. Wine. Thank you. Yes. So um, everybody always likes to know how um, often do you see Bill? And does Bill, um, when he is, um, does, well, does Testarossa every year have the same blocks? Do we switch around? Do we have the same rows? What, how does that work? So uh, first of all, I don't see Bill as, as often as I would like to. Uh, he has a reputation for kind of sneaking into the vineyard and having a look at things on his own. Uh, and we have developed a nice rapport. And so, uh, you know, I, I completely uh, get that. And uh, absolutely, Tessarosa has designated blocks that we, uh, uh, you know, have set aside uh, for Bill. And those are the places he, he comes to visit. And if he is concerned about anything, he uh, typically reaches out to Eric Johnson, who's our winemaker. And then between Eric and I and our vineyard manager, we're usually able to uh, assuage his uh, concerns. There you go. Yeah, Bill is kind of known for sneaking in, right? Just check things out. <laughs> yeah, he, he uh, flies under the radar. Yeah, very nice. See, but he gets, he has a way to make these great wines. So it must be working, right? He does. Well, and there's a lot to be said for, uh, especially with winemaking, um, maybe listening a little more than talking. Yes, I agree. We have another question for you. Okay. Hi, I'm new to wine and I'm new to this class. So who's Bill? <laughs> oh. Good, 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 good. So I should Well, Sue, I'm going to let you handle that. Yeah, so Bill Brousseau is our winemaker. Yeah, so he's been our winemaker for since 2003. He's been here before as assistant winemaker, and then he's winemaker since 2003, I believe. Um, yeah, he's great, and he is very involved with all our vineyard partners. He goes and visits them all the time. He knows exactly what's going on in every vineyard at any given time. So he's awesome. So you'll have to meet him when. You're new to, are you new to Tessarosa too? Yes. Oh, well, welcome. What's your name? Crystal. Okay, Crystal. We'll keep an eye on her. <laughs> so I wanted to also, Brian, I was reading all about the um, Judgment of Paris redo, and I thought yeah, maybe you'd perfect. like to talk about that because I thought that was really cool. Sure. Yeah, so, so we had an amazing um, opportunity in uh, 2006. Uh, it turned out that, that they decided to host a uh, sort of uh, uh, Judgment of Paris tasting, retrospective tasting, uh, the 30th anniversary 
and uh, Tally Vineyards was invited to uh, submit a wine uh, for that tasting. And it was our 2002 Rosemary's Vineyard Chardonnay. And the setup was that there were simultaneous uh, tastings that occurred both in uh, London, I believe, and uh, for sure in the Napa Valley. I happened to be in the Napa Valley that day. And uh, the Tally Vineyards uh, 2002 uh, Rosemary's Vineyard Chardonnay was judged the, the best California Chardonnay in that tasting. And that uh, is was really one of, oh, thank you. I, I can see and hear a few people clapping yes. for that. Everybody's clapping. <laughs> well, and and actually, uh, your neighbor up the road, uh, Paul Draper uh, of Ridge, from Ridge, uh, they they actually tasted the same wines from the '76 tasting, and the Ridge Montebello won that tasting. Paul and I were sitting at the same table at Copia. Uh, in in uh, the Napa Valley, which was this beautiful place that the Mondavis had, had created when we received this accolade. And it was, I, I just have to say, a career highlight to be sitting in the heart of the Napa Valley and to be recognized as, as making the best wines in California at that moment, both Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon, um, two wineries from the Central Coast. Yeah, so, that's uh, awesome. Anyway, special Excellent. day for me. Yes, and everybody knows the Judgment of Paris, right? Okay, good. So um, yeah, that that was the day that we uh, proved that uh, that uh, wines from California are every bit every bit as good as uh, the best wines in the world. Yes. Uh, how many wines were they tasting for that? Um, they tasted, um, so what they did with the Cabernets, the, the portion that Paul was, uh, uh, that Rich was participating in, they tasted the same exact group of wines from the 1976 tasting. Uh, obviously they could not do that with Chardonnay. And so they decided to update the um, group of wineries that were represented uh, on the Chardonnay side. Tally Vineyards did not exist in 1976, so we were one of the newer entries, along with uh, Peter Michael and Mount Eden Vineyards, Pats and Paul, and you know lots of the the other um, iconic Chardonnay producers. Uh, I believe there were ten Chardonnay producers uh, from California wow. represented in that tasting. The, the other little uh, secret I will share with you is that the French producers. Um, as a condition of their participation, uh, agreed or demanded that the <laughs> wines would not be tasted head to head, California versus uh, versus Burgundy, and so there were two separate tastings that occurred. Um, but I'm happy to be judged the uh, the best of the California bunch. Yes, that's awesome. Congratulations on that. Hey, everybody! I'm going to have to wrap it up. Uh, I am actually, uh, as I'm chatting with you, I'm posting a group of folks uh, here in Los Angeles uh, because I'm out and about uh, talking about Tally Vineyards. And so uh, I don't know if there's a final question or um, somehow to, to, to wrap this all up, but, but I am going to have to. Uh, to well, wrap thank this you. Up. We're going to, um, after you um, go away. <laughs> We're going to plan our bus trip down to visit you. So we'll all come together all at one time. Okay. That sounds wonderful. Uh, I, I look forward to seeing everybody at Tally Vineyards uh, whenever it's convenient. Uh, uh, visit us at tallyvineyards.com. And uh, if you want, you can email me at brian at tallyvineyards.com. And uh, uh, I will uh, honor a, uh, a reservation for you to visit. Cheers. Wow, that's great. All right, take Bye -bye. care, Brian. Thank you. All right, did everybody have fun tonight? Yes. Okay, great. Hopefully, you'll come to our next classes. We have we have our lineup, but we're just releasing a few at a time. So um, thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.